Um, so, um, welcome everyone. We are very happy to, to have you here today uh, for the big geodata talk uh, with our guest speaker, uh, Max Gabrielson uh, from DuckDB Labs. Um, today's topic is, in fact, uh, DuckDB special. So, DuckDB uh, is becoming quite famous nowadays. Uh, it's a vectorized uh, execution engine and uh, uh, quite a good performance to process a uh, large amount of, of the data. Or maybe we can tell it uh, process the data uh, by using the resources in an efficient way. So, because that's something we usually see with the geospatial workflow. So, nowadays we have quite powerful machines uh, available. Uh, but not all the software is using all the resources that are available. And I think their DuckDB shines uh, in using this modern uh, ar architecture. And Max is the developer of um, DuckDB Special Extension. So uh, he's a computer scientist uh, as, as, as background. And today we have the chance to hear from him how this development work uh, done, actually, and the challenges that he faced during this development. The floor is yours, Max. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, all right, so let's just get into it. Um, yeah, this talk is gonna be uh, probably on the longer side. I have a lot of things that I really want to, to talk about. Uh, we're gonna start a bit about DuckDB in general. Uh, we're gonna talk about the DuckDB spatial extension. I'm gonna do a very short demo. Uh, that's not really super interesting maybe, but just to get you kind of an, an idea of what using DuckDB Spatial can look like. Um, I think it's always good to just get some, some eyes on, on what I'm talking about. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about yeah, some of the challenges of writing a high-performance geospatial engine and a little bit about some trends and where I think uh, some interesting developments are happening uh, in this space. So quickly about me, uh, yeah, my name is Max Gabrielsson. I got my bachelor's in computer science from Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, I like to say that I'm a fan turned software engineer uh, at DuckDB Labs, where I mostly work on uh, DuckDB's execution layer and the geospatial extension. So DuckDB Labs is uh, a company founded by the DuckDB creators. We're based in Amsterdam. Uh, we're currently around 18 people. I think we try to keep us small small and nimble, uh, we provide developmental support for DuckDB. All right, so what is DuckDB? Uh, DuckDB is an analytical embedded SQL database. Uh, it originally started out as a research project at the CWI, uh, National Research Institute in Amsterdam. Uh, it is free and open source, MIT licensed, you get access to everything, there's no open core, no dual license nonsense, uh, it's all there. Uh, DuckDB is very portable. It has no external runtime dependencies. Or, I mean, okay, you need libc, but everybody needs that. Um, we're currently in pre-release version v0 10.3. Uh, 1.0 is right around the corner. Uh, but I think most importantly, at least for me, DuckDB makes the most out of your computer. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well. Usually, when I talk to uh, particularly people from more of a data science background, uh, there is a bit of a hesitation when I mention that DuckDB is like this really fast database. Uh, usually people are kind of, yeah, like they, they don't feel like, uh, why would I want to, you know, spin up and run a clunky database engine when I already have my, my notebooks and my data frames and my Python scripts and my R scripts uh, that I'm so used to. So let me try to explain why I think DuckDB will not only make efficient use of your computing resources, but also your time and your patience. And I'm going to try to do that by talking about what I think are the three main aspects of DuckDB. So that is execution, storage, and user experience. So let's just jump right into the execution. Um, basically, any sort of uh, query engine or database today works in one of three ways. The first is the row at a time uh, model. This is like the, the classic database approach and it, it does what you what it sounds like it's doing, right? Like if you imagine we have a table of a bunch of rows and you want to, I don't know, calculate an average or uh, do some sort of computation on it, you basically pass through one row at a time through the pipeline. Uh, this is uh, nice because it has a very low memory footprint. You only 
really have to keep like one row in memory at a time, um, simplifying. But uh, the point is that this, these systems were designed at, at a time where uh, RAM memory was very scarce. Like you would never really fit your working set in memory. But the downside of this is that you have a very high CPU overhead. The database engine wastes a lot of CPU cycles, you're shuffling data around and not actually doing any useful transformation with it. Uh, so another approach is the column at a time model. This is very common in data frames. If you worked with pandas before, this is kind of how it works. Uh, it's, on the contrary, it has like a, a very efficient CPU usage because you load the whole column in memory uh, at once. Uh, and you can, uh, yeah, if you really want to optimize, you can use these sim instructions that are implemented in most modern CPUs. Uh, but the downside is that you have a very large memory footprint. You need to load the whole input memory or input row or input column uh, in memory at the same time. And uh, you also need to materialize any immediate results for the whole column. So third model is what's called a uh, vector at a time model or vectorized processing, which is what DuckDB uses. And this kind of gives you the best of both worlds. Instead of operating on one row at a time or one column at a time, you operate on a set of rows, uh, a vector. Uh, and the trick is to kind of keep this vector size big enough to, that you like, uh, can use, uh, uh, that you don't have to, to pay a lot of synchronization overhead, but also small enough that it fits into your CPU cache, so you don't even have to go out to main memory to, to get an extra row. Additionally, DuckDB is multi-threaded. Now, this doesn't actually have anything to do with the query model. You can write uh, multi-threaded row at a time or column at a time uh, query engines as well, but it synergizes very nicely. It's very natural to parallelize over uh, vectors. And parallelism is increasingly, or becoming increasingly important. Uh, nowadays, even consumer laptops like uh, Apple's uh, M3 chip that was announced last year, even if it's on the more expensive side, it still has 16 cores, which is uh, a ton of CPU power that you're just wasting if your system can't make use of that. Um, now, there's more to talk about uh, DuckDB's query engine, uh, but usually this is kind of where a lot of the excitement around DuckDB tend to simmer down. People learn about DuckDB, it has this fast query engine, uh, it's really good, it does uh, perform very well in benchmarks, but they're missing, I think, another really crucial aspect, which is storage. All right, so, okay, why is storage important? Uh, this is a picture of every GIS or analytics project ever. Uh, basically, you start out thinking, okay, I don't need a database. So you try to keep organized yourself. You, you create your subdirectory, you have some CSV export from somewhere, uh, some, some random data files, um, and you end up having to do a lot of like chunking uh, up the data yourself because it doesn't fit into memory. Uh, you have your, your notebooks, your background scripts, uh, your, uh, yeah, your credentials to access some other uh, database. And the point is, this, this whole thing is just, it's a mess. And you have created this mess yourself by not using a database. So if you recognize this picture, then you need a database. Um, now, DuckDB has a, or a common misconception about DuckDB is that it, it's an in-memory database, which is not true. DuckDB has a, a database file format uh, where one database is represented as one file. And this is not just like a fancy uh, efficient file format for, for storing data, this is actually like a proper database. You get updates, you get these ACID uh, properties, uh, you have transactions, uh, which is really great, even if it's only you using your database in an analytical context. Uh, now, in DuckDB, uh, DuckDB is a columnar database, so it has columnar storage, meaning that the columns in tables are stored separately. Uh, and this is pretty good because if, you're, uh, if you want to query like a big table with a bunch of columns, but you only care about a couple of columns, you don't need to fetch the whole table uh, or load the whole table from disk. You only load the parts of the columns that you care about. So for example, let's say you have a one terabyte table with 100 columns. With a columnar format, if you want to read just five of these columns, let's say they're evenly distributed, so it's 50 gigabytes, from disk at 100 megabytes per second-ish, this is going to take uh, eight minutes. 
But if you use a row store, for example, like Postgres or SQLite, uh, you're going to have to read the entire one terabyte of data, which is going to take three hours. Um, now, a good thing about uh, having a columnar format is that DuckDB also can apply uh, transparent compression. Basically, individual columns often have very similar values. Uh, they have, of course, the same data type, but they usually share a distribution in some way. Uh, so in DuckDB, we apply very lightweight uh, compression algorithms, kind of transparently, without you knowing it, which can reduce uh, storage by three to five times. And paradoxically, this also improves your query speed. Uh, even though you're doing more work, technically, to compress and decompress, the fact is that you're not going to be bottlenecked by your CPU when you pull data from disk. You're going to be bottlenecked by your disk. So it's much better to store data compressed and read that and then decompress it in memory than to store it uncompressed. So here's a graph of how uh, uh, these like, storage algorithms have improved over time in DuckDB throughout different versions. Now, this is actually a pretty old picture. I mentioned DuckDB is on v010. This is from v06 uh, last year, or two years ago almost. Uh, but yeah, you can see like as we keep on adding more of these compression algorithms, we reduced a 0.5 gigabyte database file down to 0.17. All right, lastly, I want to talk about user experience. Uh, so DuckDB has this in-process deployment model. I mentioned that it's an embedded database meaning there's no separate server, there's no separate dependencies, no config, no Docker. Uh, it just runs in your process. Now, a great thing about this is that you have, uh, especially in analytical context, is that you have uh, a very small transfer or delay overhead to get data out or in to DuckDB. If, for example, you want to materialize a big result set from Postgres and get it into your notebook, Postgres has to first serialize this into some binary format, send it over the network, and then your client library has to deserialize it, and this can add up. But in DuckDB, you can skip like almost all of those steps because you share the same address space. Uh, now, this also makes it very easy to run DuckDB as part of a larger system. Uh, you can run DuckDB as part of your backend, so, you know, spin up a web server and just slap on DuckDB, and you have a budget data warehousing solution. Uh, you can run it in the client if you're developing like client applications. It even runs in WebAssembly in the browser. Uh, and you can also run it on your phone, and I think my watch, but I haven't tried. Uh, now, because DuckDB shares uh, the same resources as your main process, your application, uh, it tries to be a good guest and be play nice. Uh, and one of its ways it tries to do that is what we call graceful degradation, which doesn't sound like something a good guest would be up to, but uh, graceful degradation is basically the answer to the question, what do you do when you run out of RAM? So in DuckDB, what this means is that almost all of our operators, the different components of the system that execute different parts of, of a query, uh, will spill to disk, meaning they will offload any intermediate results uh, to your hard drive and then continue processing, and then in the end, try to reassemble everything and stream it out. Now, this isn't always possible, uh, but at least we try. The, the goal is to, to never crash and always try to make some progress. Um, so this is actually a graph from my, or a paper that my dear colleagues Lawrence and, and Hannes, together with Peter Bones, uh, published just uh, a couple of weeks ago, comparing DuckDB to some other uh, databases. Uh, as they do this big external hash aggregation, basically a big group by uh, query um, with a memory limit of 32 gigabytes. So on the x-axis, you can see the scale factor, basically the size of the data set and how the query time is affected. So you can see how most of these other engines either time out or abort once they reach past that 32 gigabyte limit, or they get this really sharp uh, spike. And that's what we try to avoid with graceful degradation. We want to have this kind of smooth curve even as you start offloading the disk. Now, these are all things that happen under the hood to make DuckDB pleasant to use, but we also have more user-facing, uh, uh, yeah, user-friendliness. <laughs> and uh, I think one of the main things that we try to do is to have a very friendly SQL dialect. Uh, so DuckDB's SQL is a superset of Postgres, 
um, we actually used the same parser as them uh, a while ago, but it's, it was the same at some point. Uh, so, but we have this nice like syntax extension. So we have this from first syntax. You can swap the from and the select uh, class in your queries, which makes I think uh, reading SQL a lot easier. Uh, if you have very wide tables, we have this group by all uh, dynamic column selection. Uh, we also support nested types and lambda functions and craziness like list comprehensions and this unified function called syntax where you can uh, pretend a function is a method basically and chain them easily. Now, uh, Dr. B also has something called extensions. Uh, so extensions are basically compiled code modules. Think of them as plugins for DuckDB, basically. Now, these are downloadable at runtime from within DuckDB, and they can provide new types, functions, operators, scans. Uh, you can write your own if you're very proficient in C++, but at DuckDB Labs, our philosophy is that anything non-essential to DuckDB core should be spun out as an extension. So this includes domain specific stuff, but also like integrations with other systems. So for example, we provide a, a JSON extension, there's an INET extension if you wanna work with like IP addresses, uh, but also integrations to other systems like a Postgres and a MySQLite and a MySQL and a SQLite uh, uh, scanner as you can query your data from Postgres through DuckDB. And of course, DuckDB Spatial. So, uh, DuckDB Spatial is a, yeah, officially supported JS extension by DuckDB Labs. It is uh, developed mostly by me. Uh, we have, we get around $70,000 a month, so uh, there is some people using it at least. Uh, and it provides your special capabilities through the simple features vector geometry type. Now, just so we're all on the same page, uh, there's basically two types of, of, of vector, or geo geometric data you can, we usually talk about, raster data or vector data, uh, rasters are uh, basically multidimensional arrays or uh, images, I think is the, the best way to think about it. Uh, while vectors are kind of like, uh, yeah, connected coordinate sequences in, in different ways. Uh, so simple features is a ISO standard, oops, uh, basically describing how to model geometries as, as vector data. Um, now, it does, does look pretty complicated, admittedly, but in practice, it's pretty simple. Basically, a geometry is either a point, a line string, a polygon, a multipoint, a multi-line string, or a multi-polygon. But you also have this uh, cursed <laughs> geometry collection type, which can contain any other geometries, including other geometry collections. So geometry is a recursive uh, type. Um, now, the spatial extension is uh, roughly modeled after what PostGIS does, or after PostGIS. DuckDB itself is very uh, inspired by Postgres, so it kind of makes sense that we try to follow the post, what PostGIS does uh, in our JS extension. Uh, we don't have full parity yet, but uh, we do provide 100 plus of these ST functions if you count overloads, so there's a, a lot of common ground. Now, I think a pretty impressive part about Spatial is that, like DuckDB, it has no runtime dependencies. It statically bundles GDAL, Geos, and Proy, which is this trifecta of open source uh, foundational geospatial libraries that provide uh, input and output uh, uh, translation to different input and output formats. Uh, Geos is this uh, geometry engine providing a bunch of uh, operations or, or geometry geometrical and computational uh, geometry operations for vector data, and Proj is uh, this library to convert between different coordinate systems. We even go as far as embedding the, this default Proj projection database into the binary, so DuckDB Spatial will immediately recognize over 3,000 different coordinate systems uh, without you having to install anything. And uh, yeah, we ship this for 10 uh, different platforms as pre-built binaries, even WebAssembly, so you can get this for uh, yeah, Mac OS, uh, Linux, Windows. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna try to do a very quick, uh, quick demo, just to yeah show a little bit of how, what it looks like to use uh, like to be. I'm gonna do this through a Jupyter notebook, uh, but uh, all my examples are gonna be uh, mostly SQL. I'm using this uh, Jupyter SQL library to to 
be able to write SQL in these uh, notebook cells. So just quickly, there's like some setup to run. Uh, I'm going to import DuckDB, notably. Um, and then I'm going to load or install and load a spatial extension. This is all you have to do. You just will fetch it from, from our servers and, and load it dynamically. Now, uh, what we're going to do in this demo is basically uh, we're going to use this New York City taxi data set that's uh, very uh, common. Uh, we're going to import it, do some lightweight data cleaning using some spatial knowledge, uh, and then we're going to join it with some, or do a spatial join with the taxi zones and try to figure out which taxi zones are more or less visited. Um, so nothing really impressive. These aren't really data sizes that, that really show the best of DuckDB, but again, this is mostly to show what's possible, I guess. So, all right, I have this parquet file with uh, one million uh, taxi trips. Uh, I can ask DuckDB to describe this for me, uh, to give me some idea of what's in this file before it even executes anything. Uh, okay, so, all right. There's a trip distance, we have a drop of latitude, a drop of longitude, there's a pickup date or a pickup longitude and a pickup latitude, cool, cool. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a table, rise geometry, by reading from this read parquet. You can kind of see now how like SQL is, you have to kind of read it backwards, so just follow along. Um, from this read parquet file, I'm gonna select the pickup latitude, pickup longitude, drop of latitude, drop of longitude, create points out of this, point geometries using this st point function, and then transform it from EPSG 436, which is like, or 4326, which is the standard kind of, when you think about latitude, longitude, like GPS coordinate system, into uh, a coordinate system identified as S3102718, which is a coordinate system that is like more suited for the, the New York area. Um, and then I'm also gonna select the trip, trip distance. And I'm gonna put all this into my rise geometry table. Uh, and this is gonna run for a couple of seconds. All right, cool. So that was one million taxi rides. Now we're gonna do some lightweight cleaning. If you have ever used a taxi data set before, you know it's a notoriously messy data set. Uh, there are, of course, better ways to do this, but I think something kind of cool uh, that uses some, some spatial knowledge is to basically look at the distance between the pickup point and the drop-off point and see if this is uh, smaller than the trip distance, or larger than the trip distance, rather. Uh, because it doesn't really make sense that you have a trip distance that is smaller than the, 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 the possible distance, basically. If you were to just, I don't know, fly straight from point A to point B. Uh, so we're gonna delete those rows from our table. Uh, I'm gonna divide the distance by 5,280 because the coordinate system we transformed into is in feet, while the trip distance is in kilometers. Uh, now, I mentioned that DuckDB Spatial embeds GDAL, so you can import and export into like 50 different uh, geospatial vector formats directly from DuckDB. Uh, so we can, we can check what's available to us uh, by calling this st drivers table function. Um, so there's a bunch of these, but really what I'm interested in is finding this S3 shape file, because that's where my taxi zones is, or the format my taxi zones are in. So I'm just gonna create my zones table by selecting from ST read, uh, which is yeah, this table function that calls into GDAL internally, uh, and creates my zones table out of that. Okay, so we had 263 zones in this shape file, cool. Um, right, we can also just check, get some kind of idea of does this uh, look uh, fine by uh, just selecting the zone and calculating the area uh, of the geometry from the zones. Okay, cool, these are definitely zones in New York, so uh, we probably have the right, right data set. Now we're gonna do some more advanced stuff. We're gonna create a table uh, called outgoing rides, where I'm gonna take the rides geometry, I'm gonna join it with the zones using this SD within uh, predicate uh, to basically say all the pickup points that are inside of this zone. Uh, and then I'm gonna return the start zone uh, and the amount of rides within that zone, because I'm grouping by start zone, if that makes sense. Uh, so this is basically gonna give us the, oh, let's just run it actually. I'm actually doing this for uh, the incoming rides as well, so we're gonna have two, two tables. Um, 
so yeah, this is going to give us the, the zones and their incoming rights and the zones and their outgoing rights. Uh, and let's look at the top 10 zone with the most outgoing rights. Okay, uh, East Village, Times Square, I guess that makes sense. Now, I'm going to join these two tables again, and I'm going to leave it as an exercise to you guys to figure out how to do this in one query, but now we have two tables. Uh, so I'm going to join again the outgoing routes and the incoming rides where the zones are the same, and I'm going to uh, divide the outgoing rides by the incoming rides and store that as my, my ratio of outgoing to incoming. Um, cool, so we can check which are the most, or which have the most skewed ratio. Uh, I actually don't know why this is the case, but I guess the airport makes sense that there are more uh, outgoing rides and incoming, maybe. You would think people have return trips as well to take, catch, but... Uh, Probably in jail. Sorry. Could be, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good, uh, good point, yeah. Uh, okay, so, but, oh, all right, so we, we get this as a table, but it would be nice to also uh, maybe plot this. Now, Dr. B can't do that itself, but we can uh, convert our geometries into a, our geometry table into a pandas data frame. Uh, this is, uses this like SQL syntax, uh, part of Jupyter to kind of pipe a result back into Python. Um, into this rest variable. Uh, we're going to call dot data frame to turn our results into data frame. We're then going to convert this data frame into a GeoPandas data frame uh, by converting our geometry from well-known text. And then we're going to use GeoPandas to plot the result. And then it looks like this. Okay, cool. So basically we get this heat map where uh, yeah, the more yellow zones are those with a higher uh, incoming to outcoming taxi ride ratio. Uh, cool, I also want to show this kind of bonus thing. Uh, I, we can imp I showed you how to import data into DuckDB, but it's also, DuckDB is pretty useful to kind of output or export geospatial data as well. Uh, this query is a little gnarly, um, admittedly, but basically what I'm doing is I'm joining uh, all the rides with both the, uh, the pickup zone and the drop-off zone, and I am then converting it back into, or I'm, I'm creating a line geometry out of the pickup and drop-off point, uh, converting it back into uh, latitude longitude, or rather longitude latitude, because I'm going to export this with GDO to GeoJSON. But I'm going to partition it by the start and end uh, borrows in this case. So this gives us kind of a uh, nice partitioned data set where, yeah, we get this, this subdirectory for every, every partition. So uh, we can easily find uh, all the trips that start in Brooklyn, but also end in Manhattan. Uh, and this, yeah, is a GeoJSON, as I'm sure you'll recognize. Okay, cool. This is all I really wanted to show you uh, about, uh, or yeah, how to use uh, the special extension. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's keep it going. So, uh, yeah, DuckDB Special is already uh, pretty useful, mostly because it uh, uh, gives you kind of access to all of these geospatial tools, like yeah, doing uh, prediction transformations, import and export to different formats, formats. Uh, basic geospatial operations, but there's still uh, lots of work to do. Uh, notably, a very much lacking feature uh, in the spatial extension is the lack of spatial indexes, which also impacts joint performance. Uh, and this is kind of sad because spatial joints are like the bread and butter of, of geospatial processing. Uh, but this is something that we're, we're uh, actively uh, working on. Also, uh, as you saw, there's, uh, it's a little annoying to kind of handle uh, projections and CRS. You had to, as in the demo, we had to kind of juggle them uh, manually. Ideally, you would have that be part of the geometry column itself and your geometry table. Uh, but that's yeah, also something that has very recently been blocked by some stuff in, in DuckDB that I just managed to, to unblock. Uh, also, of course, we want to work on uh, getting better like ecosystem integrations. Uh, DuckDB and DuckDB Spatial Extension right now is seeing a lot of use for people that want to read and write Geoparquet, but the Spatial Extension can't actually write 
or read Geo Parquet uh, like properly. You you still have to do uh, some manual managing of of the Geo Parquet specific metadata, even if DuckDB itself has a very very good uh, Parquet reader. So yeah, there, there's still like a lot of things that I uh, really want to get going with, but. Uh, I, this is all on the way because I've spent a lot of time focused on, on the last year at least building a, a good foundation for, for the spatial extension that we can build on top of. And this is actually starting to, to pay off. Uh, so what I really want to talk about is <laughs> some of the kind of internals of the geospatial extension and some of the, the one of the big challenges that I've been dealing with and how I kind of uh, envision this to maybe uh, also work in the future. So uh, let's talk internals. So, okay, one of the big challenges in adopting or adapting DuckDB to, to be a geospatial processing engine is that geometries in general require loss of memory, much more memory than uh, most other data types that you would store in, in a SQL table. Like a point, a geometry point is at the very least uh, yeah, 24 bytes, right? Because you have two doubles and then some, some metadata. Uh, and, okay, normally for most special databases, this isn't really a problem. But for DuckDB, this gets kind of compounded by the fact that we have this vectorized execution model. We want to hold a bunch of geometries in memory at the same time in this vector. Uh, or, yeah, rather multiple vectors, because usually there's more than one vector going through your pipeline at different stages. Um, and really, a big, uh, or one of the big issues is that because we rely on uh, these other libraries like Geos, which is most of our uh, geospatial functions are implemented on top of, we have no control over how they manage memory. All right, but wait, what about disk spilling, right? That was the whole thing. DuckDB can manage uh, running out of memory. Well, in order to, for DuckDB to be able to make use of disk spilling, it requires that DuckDB also can track the memory that's in use, which we can't do if it's uh, generated or allocated by a third-party library. Um, also, we can't really pass pointers around into DuckDB. Like, one idea would be maybe, okay, you let Geos allocate some geometries, storing it as they do, and then you just keep the pointer in the, in the DuckDB vector, but DuckDB core, the system doesn't know about Geos or how the lifetimes of these pointers are supposed to be managed, so, uh, yeah, it wouldn't know how to, how to free them, basically. Uh, another thing that's pretty problematic is that geometries are variable-sized, uh, and they are also recursive, right? We have this recursive geometry collection uh, problem, meaning that there, there's like no fixed memory layout for, for geometries. So in practice, what this means is that DuckDB has to store geometries, even in, during execution, as blobs, basically. It's the, the only uh, variable size type that DuckDB really supports. Even strings are implemented on top of, of blobs. Blobs being just yeah, a variable size of bytes, basically. Um, so what this means is that uh, basically geometries, even as they pass through the execution engine, uh, yeah, they're stored as blobs and in this kind of encoded format. Uh, if you imagine this is like one row uh, with a, a geometry column containing a polygon. Uh, there's always like some metadata in the front and then, uh, yeah, the, the type of the geometry, in this case it's a polygon, and then the count of how many rings it has, and then the rings also have a count of how many vertices they have, and then their vertices are laid out. So it's kind of like a tree structure, but like flattened, basically. If you're familiar with how well-known binary works internally, then this is, uh, it's very similar, except, yeah, we do some, some, some small changes. Now, this is, the problem is that this is a very annoying uh, format to work with when you implement geospatial operations. Geos doesn't know how to work with this. So basically every time we execute a function, we have to first deserialize this geometry blob into uh, yeah, some, some like, geometry representation that yeah, in many cases is gonna be inside of Geos. Uh, which, okay, in Geos is this kind of uh, object-oriented polymorphic uh, hierarchy, right? And then we have to serialize it back again into DuckDB as we pass on to the next uh, part of the pipeline. 
And yeah, this is the, the kind of problematic part, because this whole intermediate step, we once has to copy all the data, basically, or store it twice, and we have no knowledge of, of how this data uh, is allocated, uh, or how big it is, right? So, okay, what can we do about this? Well, one option is to maybe revert to doing a row at a time model, basically. Uh, so, yeah, we pass a geometry into geos, do some execution, and then immediately free it uh, and, and return uh, to the next row, basically. But then we lose kind of the whole point of this, this vectorized efficiency, and we still end up doing a lot of allocations and deallocations in the, the hot loop of our, of our function. Additionally, something that would be nice if we could also make sure to reuse some of the auxiliary data structures that a lot of these geometrical operations produce, uh, like buffers, edge lists, uh, indexes, etc., between rows. Like that would be a great boon to the to the vectorized execution model. So, the plan is basically, or has been, to kind of slowly replace these geos-based uh, operations with our own native representation and, and algorithms. Um, and this works in one of two ways. So one is to keep using this sort of materialized geometry tree model, but try to be a bit clever in how we represent this, this, uh, this geometry hierarchy. Instead of having a polymorphic uh, object-oriented hierarchy, we instead try to uh, have like a unified node data structure. Uh, so in practice, Instead of having, yeah, like an object-oriented hierarchy, like you would usually model these kind of simple features, uh, uh, geometries, uh, we instead, yeah, just have one struct for any sort of geometry, which either then contain child pointer to other geometries, like in case if you have a multipoint or even a polygon, right? A polygon is really just a count and a pointer to line strings or rings, while uh, line strings and points just have a pointer to data. And this is pretty nice because by having this just one class that is also pretty small, uh, we can make use of arena allocation. We basically allocate, we ask DuckDB for a big buffer of memory in the beginning of our function and we use that to store all of these uh, nodes in our geometry tree. We can also, because we have control over this data structure, use these pointers to kind of reference the vertices in the serialized blob without actually having to copy them. So, yeah, if you imagine, like, uh, we have our, our serialized geometry blob, we can kind of materialize this, this geometry tree uh, by just pointing into the, the serialized blob. So we don't have to copy over the vertices, which is actually where most of the, the size of, uh, of our geometry is. We, that's, like, the expensive part of, of duplicating or copying geometries. Now, another alternative is to basically just scan the serialized geometry as is, right? Uh, don't deserialize, or rather calculate as you're deserializing, right? So this is what's commonly known as like a visitor pattern. Uh, now, the downside is that you, by not having access to, to the call stack and being able to recurse through this tree yourself, you need to kind of keep your state, and it's, this can get pretty complicated uh, for more advanced geometrical operations, but for simpler properties like areas or conversions to other uh, encodings, it actually works pretty simple. So. Yeah, how it would look like, or how it kind of looks like, is that we have this, this visitor interface, the you then subclass, and then uh, this visitor knows how to scan through a, a serialized geometry blob. And we only have to implement that part once, basically. Now, uh, this works really well. We use both of these techniques uh, to, to great uh, benefit, but in general, I feel like there's something kind of there's something more to this. There is something uh, that, that still uh, annoys me with this, this simple features geometry model, uh, especially as someone trying to implement very high performance uh, algorithms. Uh, oh yeah, also I should note, uh, this thing about uh, having a visitor versus materializing a geometry tree, this is actually the same problem as parsing XML or JSON. If you ever had to deal with like an XML parsing library, they usually come in two flavors. Either they give you this tree, this document object model, or you implement this callback-based interface instead. Um, which, yeah, I thought it was kind of a, an interesting parallel. Um, but yeah, so simple features from an implementation perspective. Uh, 
if we just sidestep the, the issue with memory allocation and memory management, a big <laughs> something that makes implementing uh, the simple feature standard very frustrating is that you have this kind of combinatorial explosion of yeah, basically any function that takes more than one geometry because you have to handle all of these cases, right? Like you want to check if two geometries intersect. Okay, is what happens if you intersect a point with a line string, a line string with a point, a polygon with a line string, a polygon with a point. Like there's like seven times seven if you want to handle like the non-symmetric cases as well. Also, let's not forget, you also have this whole thing with x, y, x, y, z, x, y, m, x, y, z, m uh, vertices that also add a whole new dimension to the, the combinatorial explosion. Um, and I think also like it's pretty obvious that the specification is written uh, with a very like object-oriented programming model in mind, uh, but that also doesn't really work well uh, for us that try to be more efficient because, yeah, in object-oriented uh, program model, you usually end up having a lot of like branching and pointer chasing and virtual dispatch, which in C++ or in C languages that don't have a JIT compiler, this can actually have like pretty significant uh, performance impact. Also, I think my biggest beef in general is that you have this unbounded recursion with, with geometry collections. Basically, any function that you implement on a geometry also has to have some sort of recursive step to handle recursive geometry collections, which again makes it difficult in C++ where it's kind of hard to guard against stack overflows. Uh, also, you have this kind of problem with unbounded memory layouts, right? Like, if you have a point and a point inside of a geometry collection, even if they are the same points, they are differently, we have to treat them differently. Even though I can't imagine any place where you actually want them to be treated differently. Um, also, like, in general, just mixing geometry types is uh, pretty complex. So I'm going to do a quick quiz here. Uh, we're going to see uh, like how well you know <laughs> uh, what, what happens, how, you, how well you are aware of all these uh, corny cases, right? Okay, so you want to calculate the centroid from a multi-line string with a set component, right? There's three options here. You have a point three three, point z three three eight, or point z three three zero. Come on, shout it out. Give me your answers. Right. Huh? Three three eight. Three three eight. All right, that is wrong. Both PostJS and Geos will drop the set component. Oh yes, but you didn't, didn't give me the spec of your function. Ah, okay, okay. All right. Well, these are the two things in, that I. In geometry, it's three three eight. All right. These are the two things that I've, I've tested with. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, this is two dimensional. Yes. This, it's three. Yeah. This is true. Okay. Okay. Then let's look at this example. You have a multi-line string ZM, but it's empty. What is the result? Again, we're, we're checking against PostgreSQL and Geos. Point M. Okay. No, I would expect no. All right. Uh, the answer is both because PostgreSQL returns ZM empty, but Geos returns empty. All right. Uh, let's look at this then. Uh, you want to calculate the centroid from a geometry collection with a really a point really far away and a line string pretty close. Mm -hmm. What are the answers here? This you might actually know if you. Uh, yeah, I read up on it. This is like the kind of things that bites you once. So, all right, come on, give me an answer. Uh, without C. All right, C is actually correct. There you go. So what happens is that centroid will only consider the highest dimensional surface, which in this case is a line stream. Again, completely obvious, right? Now, would you believe me if I told you that this behavior isn't just confusing maybe for users to handle all of these edge cases, but also for implementers, right? Like, I actually had an example where you could crash PostJS, but I decided to pull it in the last minute because I don't want to be mean. But like, what I'm saying is that this is just not, it's, it's confusing for everybody, I think. Um, so the question is, can't we maybe try to do something else? At least for our you know, high performance analytics use case, we don't care about all the computational geometry. We just want to do some, centroids and areas and distances, right? So, idea, why don't we store geometries as separate types instead to avoid this kind of recursion and, and uh, uh, combinatorial explosion? And why don't we use DuckDB's nested types to do this? So, DuckDB, I mentioned previously, we support nested types, 
meaning you can store like lists or structs in columns. Uh, so how these are implemented natively is that, or internally, is that they basically, if you have a vector of a nested struct, that struct or that vector also has a child vector to represent the components. Uh, now, wait a minute. Isn't this also, doesn't this also mean that you have recursion? Well, uh, types have to be fully defined, so you can't have like a list of anything. It has to be, there has to be a limit somewhere. You have to, to, to fully define your recursion. Uh, and yeah, this kind of nested structure means that these types are highly efficient for the activity process because they basically reuse the same parts of, of the execution engine that already operates on, on vectors. So yeah, Dr. has two main nested types, structs and lists. We have some others as well, but they're kind of based on top of this. Uh, so yeah, how it looks internally for a struct. Basically, a struct vector has one vector for every field in, in, the, in the struct. And they also store a validity mask to, to uh, define if the struct itself is null. Um, so yeah, in this case, it's pretty simple. Uh, basically, our first struct, uh, we have an item and a price, and then in the child vector at the same position, you will see pants and 42. Cool. Uh, you can kind of think of struct as like a nested table, basically. It's a table inside of a column-ish. Uh, lists are a little different, though. Lists store a one column with offsets and lengths, and then the child vector with the actual data. Uh, so yeah, in this case, the first list in the offset vector, it will say, OK, at offset 0, and the three next elements are going to be the first list. And then the second list is empty, so it just says that offset three and the next zero elements are going to be the, the second list. And on the third row, uh, yeah, it says offset, sorting at offset three, and the next five elements are going to be this, uh, this list. So you can, of course, nest this in each other, which makes it pretty natural to consider, OK, what if we just store points as structs instead, right? Uh, and then if you want to have line strings, OK, just wrap that in a list. Or if you want to have polygons, wrap that in a list, right? Um, so this is actually implemented in or provided by the special extension using these kind of new types, point 2D, line string 2D, and polygon 2D. Uh, and they are really, yeah, basically defined as structs and lists of uh, structs and lists of lists of structs. Now, these don't have full parity with the geometry type, uh, but there are a couple of functions that are specifically implemented for this that are much more efficient because they don't have to do all this branching and, and deserialization. Uh, so there's no serialization overhead. You yeah, access the vector immediately from within DuckDB. There's no branching, there's no recursion. Additionally, you also benefit from DuckDB's kind of built-in statistics and, and uh, compression because, yeah, these are basically stored as separate columns as well. Now, turns out this isn't actually an original idea. And generally, I think it's kind of interesting when independent people have the same idea, it's probably maybe a good idea. So I want to talk a little bit about Geo Arrow. Are you guys familiar with Apache Arrow? Does that say anything to you? Yeah. OK, so Apache Arrow is this columnar data interchange format, basically. Uh, it is also used as the execution format in some engines like Velox and, and Polars. Uh, DuckDB isn't based on Arrow, but it, it has basically the same kind of idea. So it's, it's roughly layout compatible. Converting DuckDB uh, vectors to Arrow arrays is basically free. Uh, now, Geo Arrow is this kind of extension specification on top of Arrow. Uh, for encoding geometries as arrow arrays. So initially, it just provides uh, uh, a definition for how to, to store well-known binary encoded blobs, plus some extra metadata like uh, CRS and such into, into arrow arrays. But they also provide this arrow native columnar geometry formats that is very much similar to the ones I just showed you, the, the point to D and line string to D and uh, uh, point to D. Uh, and one thing that I can find interesting, because this is very much like a still evolving spec, but this has seen a lot of adoption or early adoption in uh, kind of geospatial processing systems that try to use or make use of GPUs or hardware accelerators, because GPUs <laughs> have the same problem that I'm trying to avoid, so trying to avoid branching and recursion. Uh, that's 
definitely not something you want to do on a GPU, right? So this is, I've seen a lot of using like kind of these tools to do large scale like visualizations, interactive visualizations of millions of you know, points uh, uh, in 60 frames per second. But also you can do a lot of geomet geometrical operations uh, like pointing polygons or centroids very efficiently on GPUs. I mean, pointing polygons is basically all the GPU does when uh, it renders graphics. Okay, so where does this leave us? Um, I don't know. I, I wish I could tell you definitely that like Gear Arrow is the future and this is what everybody is going to jump on. Uh, but yeah, this is still very much a work in progress. And I think for DuckTube's case or DuckTube's special case, it is unlikely to really replace the geometry type completely. I think for us, it's not really much a technical reason. It's more like a, a social reason, right? There is like too much shared culture around the, the simple features model, especially for SQL databases, uh, shared expectations, as you will. Like people will pick up a SQL database and immediately feel at home, even if they don't, have never read like the, the SQL, uh, the, the simple feature specification, right? Uh, there are also still some maybe unresolved technical questions about Gear Arrow. For example, in DuckDB, we really want to, uh, or we use this kind of metadata in front of our serialized blobs to store uh, and cache properties like bounding boxes, which makes a huge difference when you want to compute a join. Uh, which, yeah, it's not really clear how you would do this in Gear Arrow. Additionally, there are also some operations that do return multiple different types. You can imagine if you do like a, a coverage uh, operation, like you want to get the actual intersection out of a polygon, uh, that might not always return a polygon. You might just cut off a little corner and which point is going to just return a point. And there's, yeah, it's not really clear how to represent these kind of mixed uh, geometries in Gear Arrow as well. Now, going forward for DuckDB, I think at least I'm really excited about this uh, geometry, uh, columnar geometry model, and we're going to keep support for them alongside geometry uh, and basically provide like an optimized subset of some functions for users that kind of know their, their needs and limitations. Uh, uh, also, uh, I'm really looking forward to focus more on Geo Arrow interoperability as the ecosystem grows going forward. I think it would be really cool if DuckDB Spatial could act as kind of this bridge between yeah, the old SQL spatial world and this new uh, high performance uh, columnar geometry gap. So uh, to conclude, this talk has been about a lot of things, but <laughs> DuckDB is a portable analytical embedded SQL database. It is both fast and friendly. Uh, next time you're having trouble resolving your con environment because all of your geospatial dependencies uh, conflict, then make sure to give DuckDB Special a try. Also, you know, just floating the idea, maybe it's time to rethink the simple features model, at least for us that are really interested in, in high performance uh, computing. Uh, there's a growing, I think, spatial ecosystem around Geo Arrow. Uh, and yeah, stay tuned for uh, lots of more cool stuff coming on the way. Thank you. I think it's very, it was a very informative <laughs> presentation yeah. about DuckTV and also about TV Special. And also the last part was, I think, very nice. So the, the challenges that you see, not specific to DuckTV, but in fact uh, for geospatial computing in general, because yeah. uh, anybody who is willing to do the processing efficiently has the same issues. So it's independent from databases, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so we have a, a, some time for, for questions. So if you have any... Um, any questions to Max? I have a few, to be honest, but maybe. <laughs> oh, definitely also. Thanks oh, good, Max, yeah. for, uh, for the overview and the interesting discussion. Um, you know, five minutes into your presentation, I thought, yeah, but hold on, guy. Uh, usually, my tables that hold spatial data, 85% volume wise, is, is the geometry, and the, and the rest is, you know. <laughs> is piggybacking on that one yeah and your assumption of equally sized columns doesn't hold uh, moreover as you've also shown i mean your your example where you use points for for something look points are not a problem the, po the problems are always multi geometries yeah. especially multi polygons yeah those are the common geometries in the world yeah and those <laughs> apparently are the most problematic also 
doing away with the special, simple special features, I don't think it's going to be happening in my lifetime. I hope in yours, but <laughs> it's, it's become so common, yeah. you know, and, and it is actually a very natural model. Uh, people relate to it immediately from their, you know, secondary school mathematics yeah. times. Uh, so getting uh, that out of the way, I don't know. Uh, now, let me pose a few questions. <laughs> uh, I have a, a simple one to start with, and uh -huh. that is many people in the geospatial database world that make use of, of that type of technology, they commonly approach the database also with the GIS client mm -hmm. for their map data. Yeah. So the database doesn't do the map, you use a GIS for that. Uh, is this possible with DuckDB plus spatial? How, uh, and, and how would you set that up? Yes, so uh, there is actually two, two things in this space that I've seen. Uh, so uh, there is a QGIS plugin based on DuckDB and DuckDB spatial. Okay. I haven't used it myself. Uh, it's developed by uh, a, a third party, uh, okay. but presumably it offloads some, some heavy computations into, into DuckDB. Uh, there is also a dbeaver uh, yes. plugin for DuckDB that has spatial support from what I understand. So okay. that doesn't give you the full GIS workflow, but at least like some visualization. Database client, database administrative client more than a GIS. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, no, I think the, the, the most uh, probably uh, what you're looking for is this QJS plugin. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think also this is something that I want to, to make easier in, in the future and make, uh, yeah, like make DuckDB spatial more interoperable with, with wider ecosystem. The, it's, DuckDB itself is pretty interoperable, like you can, yeah, it has like arrow support and it connects to Postgres and MySQL and whatever, but the fact that DuckDB spatial is a separate extension makes this a little harder because you have these kind of cross dependencies yeah. across uh, extensions, so. Oh, oh, okay, another question that I have, and then I'll have mm -hmm. yield again. <laughs> um, some five or eight slides uh, from the end. You spoke about possible implementation of geometries by using structs. Mm -hmm. Now, I will admit, I did not get all, each and every technical detail that you discussed there, mm -hmm. but it felt a little bit like, oh, but, but effectively, now you have again record at the time mechanism, because that is what the struct is. Or did I, or did I misinterpret that? Yeah. So DuckDB structs are a little different because they don't. You don't get the whole record in one row. They. You basically get separate columns for every uh, for every member, right? Uh, so it's kind of like a, a struct of array layout. Okay. Uh, yeah. It, it 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 really looks internally very similar to just having another table basically inside of a column uh, every uh, yeah every row has its own uh, corresponding row in the child columns basically okay uh, final yes uh, you say you've implemented 100 plus special functions uh, post this last time I checked a thousand plus or so yeah uh, so, so what, what, is, what is, it? is that a linear growth path or is it more like I expect more complications as you go? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. I think initially when, when I first published uh, Dr. B Spatial, I kind of just went into a fr frenzy and tried to wrap everything that Gills provided. Um, and then I think it kind of it kind of caught up to me in a way uh, that, yeah, we need to kind of rethink on how this, this geometry model is represented internally. So there's been a lot of kind of cleanup and refactoring uh, the last six months, but I hope now that I have a bit of that underway and more understanding of how to work with this, um, I can get back on adding features, basically. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then I will post a few questions. Sure, so first sure. of all, we can Max here for, for lunch also. So anybody who is uh, interested to, to join, is uh, very welcome. So we can have the discussion maybe also during, during lunch. So, uh, and then I will keep my questions too short now. <laughs> so uh, one thing is, uh, so uh, basically, uh, 
You, what about the ASCRAD optimizations that you have? Okay, you, you, you support the ASCRAD, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, do you have also some um, optimization specific to geospatial uh, functions in, in place? So how, how does it work? Yes, so um, I have a, I think I have two things going on. So one is that uh, I will try to push down or actually, I don't know if this is merged. I have a sketch of this anyway. But yeah, pushing down uh, uh, predicates into... Like if you do, for example, this stread function to read from GDAL, uh, and you then immediately filter on some other geometry predicate, say, yeah, give me all these zones that intersects this, I don't know, line string or whatever, then I can rewrite that to push down the, the comparison into GDAL, uh, which for some formats, for some drivers, uh, can be more efficiently executed there, basically, before it gets up into DuckDB. Now, I think the main optimization that I have in place is for spatial joins. Mm -hmm. So, normally in DuckDB, when you join using a, like a function as a, a join condition, you get what is called like a nested loop join. It's basically comparing everything with everything. Uh, so it has like a n squared complexity. It's, it's really uh, not great. Now, uh, or I guess n times m. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's pretty expensive, especially when you have an expensive predicate. So, uh, I mentioned it a little bit. What we do in this serialized format is we, we cache the bounding box uh, of the geometry in the beginning, uh, except for points, because that doesn't make sense. But um, yeah, so the idea is we kind of we, sacrifice some write speed, right? When you do like an update or an insert, we have to compute this bounding box, but I think in DuckDB's case it makes sense because you're probably going to read more. It's an analytical database after all, right? Uh, but the thing is, once we have this bounding box, when you do a join, at least an inner join on a spatial predicate, we rewrite it to uh, turn into a range join on the bounding box first, and then move out the, the predicate as an extra filter uh, outside. Um, yeah, this sounds complicated, but basically, DuckDB has a pretty efficient range join operator. Basically, if you join with numeric inequalities as your join condition, that uses another join algorithm, uh, which can prune out a lot of the, the matches uh, without having to then run the expensive intersection check. But is that a one-dimensional range join? No, it's a multi-dimensional range join. Yeah, we join all the min x is larger than, okay. yeah. Uh, so that, that is, I think, why the DuckDB spatial uh, join isn't completely useless, even though we haven't implemented like a proper spatial join uh, operator yet. But it is something that, that I'm really looking forward to, to, to get started with. Like, DuckDB itself has a really good hash join, uh, and it's kind of depressing that uh, we don't, the spatial <laughs> counterpart doesn't uh, match up as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, um... The second thing is actually so uh, yeah introducing new new data types of course uh, from from your point of view it makes uh, perfect sense but do you think that uh, it cannot be done in a uh, hidden way to the user because user doesn't need to know these implementation details and basically I think you can already know if the data that you deal with is a mixed data type or uh, certain. Geometry, right? Because yeah. if, you a, if you import a shape file, we know that it's mi not mixed, and if, yeah. you, if you create the geometry yourself, you already know. So, uh, could it be possible to, instead of uh, uh, out, uh, um, outsourcing the work, completed to geos, to be a bit more selective, and if you can do the work by, by yourself, and just go, go in that way, instead of yeah. asking users explicitly to indicate that? Right. Um, so, I think. It generally is pretty uh, transparent. Um, so, uh, yeah, basically how it works is that for these new geometry types, they are always implicitly castable to the geometry type. So, uh, the idea is that if you want, you can define your table or your column to have this, this new type, and when you apply functions that are implemented for that type, you get those optimized functions, otherwise, you perform an implicit cast of geometry, which then uses the geometry implementation, either uh, mine or geos, depending on what operation you use. Um, now, okay, this cast is maybe a little expensive, but uh, not that expensive. Like, you still kind of benefit from the, the columnar uh, representation, even when you convert it to, to something else. 
So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I think it's. Uh, I think we. I, I try to make it. Uh, yeah, try to make it friendly for the user, uh, but I do think at some point you need some way to differentiate between implementations uh, or internal implementations, and I think doing that at the type level is probably the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from the chat. Yes. Uh, it's more regarding that DB, not uh, special action. Sure, sure. Uh, if, uh, one of the viewers asked that if you are gonna, uh, if you are going to host data on the cloud mm -hmm. and you have multiple users access at, they want to access at the same time. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? Um, right. So, DuckDB can't do writes remotely, right? But it can do reads remotely, um, even like for the, the DuckDB database file format itself. But I think a really common thing I see DuckDB deployed as is by storing, uh, yeah, basically you store your, you export your data as Parquet files onto S3 and then everybody can have their own instance of DuckDB reading these, these files. Now there are also like a couple of uh, these new kind of cloud data warehousing solutions like Iceberg and uh, Delta Lake that try to kind of build, <laughs> build into like up, updates and inserts on top of immutable Parquet files. And DuckDB does have extensions to uh, support both Iceberg and Delta to some degree. They're, I think they both are a little uh, not completely feature complete, but that is uh, definitely one, I think, very common thing that I see people use DuckDB in while for some sort of data warehousing solution. Yeah. And this sounds like a very different user niches, right? Your, your typical large DBMS is a multi-user system. Yeah. That is almost the primary reason for creating it. Yeah. Protect the whole technology. Yeah. And this has a different application niche. Exactly. I think there's a lot of, uh, like, I, I agree with you. I think for a lot of people, just having a big enough database would be good for them. But I think what makes a lot of people excited about DuckDB is that you can kind of decouple compute and storage by running these things on, on or uh, yeah, storing things as like Parquet or, or DuckDB files on S3. Uh, yeah, I, again, a very common thing I see is that people slap in DuckDB into a Lambda function and then uh, have some batch job that produces S3 files overnight and then yeah, you can query them through DuckDB through like a web server on AWS, and then you have built basically your own mini data warehouse, uh, mm -hmm. more or less. But why don't you use uh, DuckDB native file format in that case, but why geofile? Yeah, uh, good question. I think uh, people are a little afraid that, that there's some vendor lock-in, right? DuckDB only, only DuckDB can really read DuckDB's file format, mm -hmm. um, while Parquet has, you know, implementations in, in most languages, I think. Um, I don't know, there, there have been some, I think some people that are interested in maybe using DuckDB as kind of a cloud native format as well. Um, my personal opinion is that I think that's gonna be difficult because I think the DuckDB format has a lot of very DuckDB specific things that are hard to, uh, it's hard to, to uh, makes it hard to read from a third party uh, implementation without also implementing half of DuckDB, but yeah. Thanks a lot. I think we are already over time in a bit, but I think it was a very nice um, uh, discussion and presentation from Max. Uh, yeah. uh, Thank you. Uh, Make sure to grab some stickers. Yeah, we have some I have nice, a ton. Uh, Dark stickers. Feel, feel, feel free to pick. And uh, also, uh, we will go to lunch from here, so feel free to join if you want to continue the discussion. Thanks a lot, Max. Thank you.